Kicking off the list at number 10, let's dive in. Ooh, Barracuda. Exploring the deep is dangerous if you're a diver, of course, not because of the deadly ocean life surrounding your every direction, but because if you come up too quickly, major health problems will follow. But if not that, probably a deadly Barracuda. Equally as scary. This deep discovery was made by user Arira95. I'm pulling real events for this one from real deep sea divers. We're going to the real content for this one, so buckle up. One time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her and it was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive at this point, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. I'm sweating reading this. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her staring intently at that shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and they slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore. But still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little more aware of her surroundings when she's diving. I mean, fair, but I mean, no one expects a barracuda. Also, if your mom wants to dive with chains on, that's pretty sick. You won't catch her slacking. Even in the depths of the sea, she's like, I'm ready. I don't care who shows up. I don't care who I bump into. Water shoes and bling. Check and check. Let's go diving. In our number nine spot today, we have this underwater knocking. This knocking sound was picked up by an underwater hydrophone, and for a while it had people stumped until they were able to find the culprit. Before we talk about what this sound is coming from, imagine being in the deep, dark, icy waters and hearing that sound. It is straight up out of a horror movie, but as it turns out, the real source isn't quite as scary. This is actually the sound of a species of haddock fish. These types of haddock are a ray finned fish that can be found in the North Atlantic Ocean. The males of the species will produce this drumming or pulsating sound in order to attract mates during the mating season. Outside of the mating season, a similar sound is also produced, and that is known to be used during a aggressive encounters with other male fish. In our number 8 spot today we have the 52 Hertz whale. This whale has been nicknamed the loneliest whale in the world, but the truth is, we don't even really know if that's true because we've never actually seen it. This whale, which we don't know if it's male or female or what whale species it belongs to, sings its song like no other whale does. This whale was first heard in 1989 on a hydrophone, and while the calls were most similar to that of a blue whale, there was one striking difference and that was the frequency of the calls. This whale calls at 52 hertz with regular blue whales calling between 10 and 40 hertz. Even fin whales are usually heard at 20 hertz, so it left everyone stumped as to what could be going on here. A researcher named Bill Watkins dedicated his life to trying to reveal what exactly was going on here, and while he passed away in 2004, he found that this whale was not only unusual, but totally unique. The biggest challenge is the fact that we cannot locate this whale. Their calls can be heard for hundreds of miles and trying to find one single whale in the vastness of the ocean is next to impossible. Many people have suggested that perhaps the whale is deaf, and this is what has led to its unique song, but of course without the whale, how would we possibly know for sure? In our number 7 spot today we have Slow Down. Slow Down is another sound that was captured in 1997, but this one was captured on May 19th of that year. The 90s was apparently the height of the capturing weird unexplained ocean sounds wave because wow, there are so many. This sound got its name because of the fact that the sound descends in frequency over about 7 minutes. Again, this is another sound I would have just assumed was ghosts, but luckily there are people out there who know more than me who continue to research these things and try to get to the bottom of these mysteries. This sound was so loud it was detected by different sensors nearly 5,000 kilometers apart from each other. Scientists were able to locate the sound as coming from somewhere off the Antarctic Peninsula. While they couldn't directly find the source of the sound, they used their deductive reasoning and it is currently believed that the sound might have been the result of a drifting iceberg as it scratched the sea floor until it slowly came to a stop. I guess the icebergs were just moving around a lot in the mid to late 90s. In our number 6 spot today we have the Psy Whale. Here we are again with another whale sound that just truly doesn't seem like it should be the sound coming out of any living creature, but hey, 
in the sea the rules are just different and everything's a little weirder. These whales can be found in subtropical, temperate and subpolar waters around the world. There are sadly a species that has seen their numbers decrease rapidly, especially due to the historical commercial whaling that took place in the 19th and 20th centuries. The exact number of these whales that currently exist is unknown, but they are a species that is currently listed as being threatened. Like many other whales, these guys use their voice to communicate with one another and that is where this sound comes from. Other than the sound that they're making, the increase in noise under the water, especially man-made noise, is actually a threat to their existence. The sound can interrupt their normal behavior and drive them away from areas that are important to their survival, and sometimes intense exposure to noise can even cause one of these whales to strand and die, which truly is just awful. In our number 5 spot today we have Star Wars. Okay, you might be wondering why something relating to Star Wars is on this list since we are talking about the sea, but just listen to the sound and then tell me what you think. That sounds kind of like little fighter jets or something, right? Well, it definitely had some people stumped for a while when it was first heard, but luckily this one has a fairly simple and harmless explanation. The Star Wars sound is actually coming from dwarf mink whales. Apparently a lot of strange ocean noises end up either being attributed to whales or icebergs. Considering how creepy this sound can be when they have no explanation, I'm kind of glad to know that most things end up being relatively harmless and way less scary in reality. In our number 4 spot today we have the Atlantic Cod. Atlantic Cod are known for their ability to produce clicks, growls and thumps as their way of communicating. The clicks I'm about to show you are apparently intended to ward off potential predators including humans and I truly feel like it might be working. While this sound was recorded on a hydrophone, it's been said that divers who have encountered these fish in the ocean have also been able to hear these warning clicks so as to let them know not to get close. These fish also of course have different less aggressive sounds as well that they use for things like mating season or to be able to warn others of their kind of potential dangers that are lurking in the icy waters. In our number 3 spot today we have the ping. This is a sound that no one has been able to figure out where it is coming from. I'll admit this one wasn't captured by a submarine, but I had to include it because it is coming from the water and it is so mysterious that scientists and even the military still aren't sure what exactly is going on here. This sound can be heard in the Kikitalik region of the Canadian territory Nunavut and is coming from the Fury and Hecla Strait. This sound has been described by some as a ping and by others as a hum, but the main issue is that this area is a hunting area and whatever the sound is, it is scaring off all of the wildlife. Because of the reports of this mysterious sound, even the military came to investigate, but still, no one is exactly sure where this sound could have been coming from or what it could be linked to. For now, the mysteries that lay below the Arctic ice are destined to remain a secret. In our number 2 spot today we have, hmm? This sound is one that was captured on a hydrophone and it truly sounds like someone just trying to add some infliction to their voice to ask a question. I'll give you one second to take a guess first. Did you guess another whale? Well, you'd be right then. This sound is coming from the North Atlantic right whale and is not just the sound of a super confused person. These whales are one of the world's endangered large whale species with there being only 400 left in the Atlantic Ocean. The sound you just heard is the sound they use to communicate with others of their species. Their sounds are usually low frequency moans or groans and they are used to indicate things like warnings, contact, aggression or just other social signals in general. In our number one spot today we have boom. Okay, maybe the last one was a little too easy so here's another sound that I'm gonna let you guess and maybe it will be a little harder this time. Do you have a guess as to what that big boom was? Apparently that sound was caught on a hydrophone and it is coming from an underwater oil rig. Remember when we were talking about the man made sound pollution of the deep sea and how it affects the marine life? This is exactly the kind of thing we were talking about. I don't have the solution on how to make it better or how to fix the problem, all I know is that it is one and honestly how could it not be? That sound freaked me out while I was sitting comfortably at my desk researching, so I can imagine hearing it when I wasn't 
expecting it in the comfort of my own home. That just sounds awful. Number 10, Socotra Island. Socotra Island has been surrounded by mysteries and myths since the time it was discovered. Between the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, the legends of the island date back all the way to ancient times. The reason it's so often spoken about is due to the strange abnormalities on the island. It's weird, and people like that stuff. That's why you're here. It is full of flora and fauna that don't exist anywhere else in the world. One of the most iconic trees is something called the dragon's blood tree. It kind of looks like somebody took like an evergreen tree and like shh, gathered all the pins and needles to the top and it's all veiny. It's so weird. Mysterious mists and bleach white sand flow over the isolated island in ways no one can explain. The island is also host to a wealthy collection of spiders, no thank you, reptiles and birds, many of which are native and endemic to the island. It certainly is like no other place on earth with many secrets still yet untold. Number nine, the frilled shark. Another scary shark, awesome. Back in 2004, marine biologists discovered this dinosaur, the frilled shark if you want to call it a shark, okay. It was lurking about 870 meters below the surface. This one looks like an eel, almost. It's so scary looking. Oh, I hate this. I hate the ocean. Frilled sharks can grow up to seven feet long and they fight like daredevil. They can hunt in complete darkness. They don't need to see anything to whoop your ass. Remember that next time you're uh, skinny dipping. Mm -hmm. Unless you can hold your breath for a seriously long time, you won't run into the frilled shark anytime soon. They're only found about a mile below the surface, so sleep swimmingly tonight. Number eight. Black dragonfish. All of these fish are so scary looking, and no, not all of these things are fish. Just a few off the hop, because, ooh, get them out of the way. The black dragonfish is the first time scientists have found an ultra black deep sea fish. This thing is awesome, I love this. The black dragonfish literally has the word dragon in it, and I'm not surprised. He fits it, he fits the picture. These little guys can be found at depths of 1600 feet, and you'll see this one coming towards you, as these fish too possess bioluminescence. If you can't tell from these photos, um, they also have teeth. They have big, scary, dragon-like teeth. Even Khaleesi would see this and be like, no, no, I'm good. Number seven, Apollo 11. They say space and the ocean are pretty similar, but nobody expected to find this. The engines of the Saturn V rocket that fell off during the Apollo 11 missions, they should have never been found, realistically. The odds here are just mind-blowing. Right off coastal Florida waters found 16,000 feet below the ocean surface. These things are massive. They're so heavy we could barely get them out of the sea. You know who found this thing laying on the ocean floor for more than 40 years? Jeff Bezos. Yep, Amazon CEO Jeffrey Bezos. J Bees. He found this. He found these back in 2012. What's the shipping fee for a couple of Apollo 11 rockets? It's probably not cheap. Number six, USS Johnson. Once a US Navy destroyer, the USS Johnson sank during the Battle of Samar back in 1944. It sank after a battle with a large fleet of Japanese warships. Victor Vescavo, one of the few to reach the Marianas Trench, was the first one to stumble upon the remains of this sunken warship. The remains were found quite recently, back in 2019, and it's now known as the deepest known shipwreck of all time, which is a weird brag. She was found 6,450 meters deep in the Philippine Sea in the Pacific Ocean. To quote Victor, who at the time was leading said expedition, he says, the wreck is so deep that there's very little oxygen down there. And while there is a little bit of contamination from marine life, it's remarkably well intact, except for the damage it took from the furious fight, end quote. The ship is so deep that it took them a handful of trips just to locate the thing entirely. There were 327 crew members on board the ship during the battle, and sadly, only 141 of them survived. The diving team was respectful about their mission, and they laid wreaths both before and after their dives, which is just a nice thing to note off at this point, honestly. Number five, underwater civilization. As we found out in part one of this series, the ocean, being mostly undiscovered, is terrifying. Yep, never going in it again, for sure. But discovering a long lost civilization underwater, okay, I'll admit, that's not scary. That's actually kind of cool. It's pretty neat, we like those. Found 65 feet below sea level off the coast of Sweden. Researchers from Lund University found a Stone Age civilization that dates to around 9,000 years old. They found artifacts that are in great condition, all things considered. They even found an elk antler ax. How epic is that? That's some Elder Rings kind of stuff right there. That's some good loot. Some of these discoveries, they still have to work out. They're not even sure what they found. What researchers do know is that this ancient civilization, they had a healthy life based on what they found. There's lots of food, findings suggest that it was warm out often. It was great and all, you know, until the sea rose up and swallowed the Swedish lagoon. The forest surrounded lagoon just ceased to exist, and we're not really sure why. The more ocean we discover, the more we learn about our past. And if we can also find treasure along the way, that would, that would be helpful, that'd be great. Number four, 
USS Nevada. The USS Nevada was lost in 1948 and it wasn't until a year ago where she was seen again. Yeah. The USS Nevada was referred to as the unsinkable ship and here's why. During the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, the USS Nevada was the only battleship to get away in one piece. But Barely. It took years of repairs after that, but she returned to battle later in 1944 to support the Normandy invasion. A year later, it assisted in two atomic bomb tests, and post-World War II, she was finally deemed too ancient for service. So the Navy used the USS Nevada as target practice, and it took them five days and lots of power to finally sink it. How impressive is that? They almost couldn't sink the ship when they tried. That's kind of brilliant. The torpedo was the final strike, and after it sank, the Navy wasn't even sure where exactly it ended up. It was more than 15,000 feet below the surface, so it could have gone literally anywhere. Cut to only a couple years ago, a joint expedition by Ocean Infinity and Search Inc. led by Dr. James Delgado, they found her. Just 65 nautical miles southwest of Pearl Harbor. All the way down. Number three. Amelia Earhart's plane. Yeah, you heard me. How epic is this? The first woman to fly across the Atlantic, she was well on her way to settling even more groundbreaking records, but her plane tragically disappeared over the Pacific in 1937. It's since been a great mystery where the final resting place of Amelia Earhart now is, but we may have actually found her remains back in 1940 on the Pacific island of Nikamuraro. The initial examination of these remains were reported to be that of a man. That was the general idea in 1941. But come 2018, we have a different idea now. Now, something's come up. Researcher Richard Jantz took another look at the long lost remains, and since then, photos of Amelia have surfaced, so Richard compared the bone measurements to her body type, and we're pretty sure that's her. But in a recent discovery, May 2021, a murky image went viral, and many believe it's Amelia Earhart's plane submerged in Nikumaroru Lagoon. Back in 1991, part of a plane fuselage was recovered, but it was too damaged to confirm that it was her plane from when it went down in 1937. Do you think it's her? Sound off below, I, I do. Definitely. Or else someone else's remains are out there and that's also wild. Let's discover who that is. Number two, crop circles. Before we end off this list, we'll get a little cute, dare I say. Crop circles on the ocean floor. Are these aliens, alien fish? Do we have this now? Is this a scary shark? What's going on here? These crop circles were first spotted back in 1995 off the southern coast of Japan. And for 16 years, these things were blowing the minds of divers or deep sea explorers. Nobody knew where they were coming from. They would be there one week and then the next day would be gone. Tiny aliens or tiny pufferfish. That's right, in 2011, one of these dudes got caught in 4K and it's one of the weirdest things I have ever seen. I had to squeeze it in some sort of deep sea list. I love showing this little guy off. These male puffer fish, they try and lure in the ladies by making art. Some birds dance like crazy, some fish make art, okay? Animals have souls, deal with it. The thing that baffles me here, con concerns me if anything, is that these puffer fish use a shell. They use a shell in their mouth, they, um, they grab it and then they scoop out these designs. He uses a tool to carve away his emotions. Small but mighty, and also an artist. And finally, number one, squid graveyard. During a 2012 expedition in the Gulf of California, lurking all the way at the bottom of the seafloor, scientists came across a bunch of squid carcasses and squid egg sheets, which I mean, you know, in your working day, that's a lot to see, just going along and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yikes, okay. But anywho, once they took photos, they got footage, all was good, they returned. Come 2015 though, that's when these deep dives get a little mysterious. When they returned to the exact same area, they found even more carcasses and even more squid egg sheets. What's going on? Why here? Is this like a hot spot? So many questions. Many species of squid will see the adults all join in large groups and lay clusters of eggs in the seafloor, but shortly after this, many of the adults will die. Nature is cruel. This is the case for most things. But it's not the case for every squid, however. There are some mothers who instead lay their eggs on an egg sheet, which they keep in between their arms for months. And when the babies finally hatch, the mother will then drift her way down to the seafloor. So this answers why that squid died, but it doesn't answer answer why there's so many bodies and so many types of squid births and stuff happening in one specific zone. And that answer still remains a mystery, hence why it's our number one today. At number 10, we have an octopus nursery. Eight-legged alien looking things with suction cups all over their arms and beaks for mouths. Octopus are creepy looking things and to top it all off, they can camouflage like a navy seal and they are super smart. If these are the kind of things that make your skin crawl, then just running into one of these guys would probably freak you out. Well, on the underwater expedition at the Davidson Seamount, there was a rather shocking discovery. They had a remote probe that was on the ocean floor around 10,000 feet, and they came across which seemed to be an octopus that was next to not just one, not just two, but a group of 1,000 octopuses in a nursery. They were all there laying their eggs and using the heat from the volcanic vent to keep them warm. I would hate to be the guy who accidentally steps into that crack and then gets devoured by thousands of 
sticky arms. But if you're at 10,000 feet underwater, you probably are already screwed. Number nine, submarine propeller. When it comes to creepy sounds or signals heard from the ocean, here or out there, it really depends on who you ask if it's creepy or not. A submarine propeller firing up underwater to many is nothing. Just another day working on the Navy, if anything. But this guy with submechanophobia, the fear of big things underwater, the sound of a submarine propeller firing up is absolutely haunting. My palms are literally sweating just reading this. The noise of the propeller is traceable, but the sonar, that can mess up some whales. Sonar underwater is so loud you can feel it through your entire body. It's definitely not something you want to witness up close. It's like standing near the speaker at a club. Your bones just feel it. Take a listen. Take a listen. Also, a little headphone warning. It's kind of, it's exactly what you expect. Number eight, slow down. Not to be confused with Slow Ride, that's an absolute banger from the 70s. Slow Down was recorded on May 19th, 1997, so a little bit later. It was picked up in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, just in the middle of literally nowhere. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration picked it up not once, but several times every year. Our best guess as to what this sound is, perhaps it's moving ice in Antarctica. But the fascinating part here is that this sound decreases in frequency over time. It takes about seven minutes in total, so we can't include the entire clip or else you'd be pretty bored. But here's the clip 16 times as fast. Scientists believe the sound is a massive iceberg scratching against the ocean floor over, of course, seven minutes. And then after seven minutes, it came to a, a halt. But the fact that we hear this sound every year, that's the concerning part. We're like, why is it, is it coming out and then halting again? Cthulhu, is that you or is it a lot of ice melting? Most likely the latter, but who knows? Number seven, whistle. If you can whistle, honestly, hats off to you. I've been trying for years. My lips are too dry and too weak. I have weak lips, apparently. The whistle recorded in July 1997 is not weak, and as this list hint towards, it's certainly not dry. The thing with this mysterious sound is that it was only picked up by one hydrophone, meaning scientists can't pinpoint its location, making this an unexplained sound. It came from somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, so sleep with that in your head. Somewhere, how calming is that? Here's the unidentified sound. What do you think this is? The National Oceanic and the, sorry, the NOAA rather, has compared the sound to some volcanic activity heard in the Mariana Volcanic Arc. But again, we can't pinpoint it at all, so we have no idea. We need three hydrophones to do so. This one was only heard in one. Number six, upsweep. Unidentified yet again. Love to hear it, literally. Sound travels much faster underwater than it does in air, more than four times as fast. So when we hear these noises, one, they're incredibly loud, which is the most impressive part in my opinion, but because sound travels so quickly, it's hard to find out where these calls are coming from. Upsweep is an unidentified sound that was heard throughout the entire Pacific Ocean. When the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory fired up its sound surveillance system back in August 1991, these sounds were heard. See, unlike the sounds we've covered so far, this one happens in real time. It's not sped up because it's 17 minutes long, it's just, that's it, that's what it sounded like. These upsweeping sounds lasting a few seconds each ping is definitely concerning. The source was roughly located around New Zealand and South America, somewhere around those places, and it peaks around autumn and spring. So maybe it's just a monster tucking itself in for the winter, and then maybe it's waking back up in spring. Who knows? Scientists at the NOAA have a better idea so far. A little boring, but they believe it's underwater volcanic activity. I say boring, it's not really boring, it's just predictable, I guess. This sound has been getting lower pitched every year, so who knows? Maybe that's a bad thing, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe this thing's gonna go off. Maybe it's gonna go off tomorrow. That was 30 years ago, so any day. Number five, Julia. Who is she? Who is this Julia chick we've been talking about? Julia sounds like a rather friendly addition to this list, but don't let her name fool you. Julia is... Terrifying, definitely, yeah. Back in March 1999, this noise here was recorded again by the NOAA, and this time the noise was heard across the entire Pacific Ocean hydrophone array. So across all that distance, we heard Julia. So whatever made this noise, be it an iceberg, volcanic activity, giant fish from Legend of Zelda, it's got power behind those vocals, you know? She's loud. The point of its origin is determined to be somewhere around Bransfield Straits and Cape Adair. This Cape Adair gets a lot of action in the world, sound-wise and bloop-wise, and we think it's because of icebergs, but maybe the Kraken's name is just Julia. 
Maybe this is her just slowly introducing herself to the world. Again, it's a long clip in real time, but sped up, sounds like somebody's humming underwater. It's terrifying. Take a listen. This one creeps me out a lot, a lot. I think I've heard the hum before. I don't know, maybe it was Kid Cudi in the distance, maybe it was this hum. Either way, I'm on board. The hum has been heard for decades now. We have no idea where the hum is coming from. Our best guess is that it has something to do with, of course, as the title hints, the ocean. A resident from Woodland, England spoke out on their experience saying it vibrates through the house. We've turned all the electricity off in the house and we can still hear it, so it's not that. It's not tinnitus, that's a high pitched sound and this is very low. If I put my fingers in my ears, it stops, so I know it's not in my head. It's heard commonly in Hawaii, Britain, North America, so it's, hey, everywhere. It's been heard everywhere, I guess. Some have called it the Windsor hum, which is insanely close to us, hence why I think I've heard it in real life. I put the microphone to you now. People, the fine people of YouTube, have you heard the hum? If so, where were you? Comment down below. Number three, 2021 boom. A little bit more recent for this one. Back in early 2021, San Diego residents reacted to what sounded like a sonic boom. Well, it's been heard three times since the initial report. And many still have questions. I have questions. Now you have questions. Windows were shaking, doors were rattling, all of San Diego heard and felt this thing. But what was it? An earthquake? Being in San Diego and all residents are used to earthquakes, but this was entirely different. Everyone felt something new here. Also, it helps to know that no earthquakes were reported at this time, so that theory is just out of the way. And the Marines didn't take responsibility for it as well. And if it was a sonic boom from a plane, well, that would be pretty obvious. We'd kind of have an idea. We'd have a few ideas if it was a plane ripping overhead. Plus, they're not allowed to do that kind of stuff that close to the coast. December 28th, 2021, residents were posting their thoughts on Twitter. One user tweeted, San Diego Diego is cool because I'm like, oh wow, just felt an earthquake, but not actually, it was a sonic boom. Well, keep an ear out for any more mysterious sonic booms coming from the ocean in 2022. The last one wasn't long ago at all. If you live in San Diego, drop us a comment, help us understand what's going on. Number two, the train. This sound was given its name because, well, it sounds like a passing train in the distance. Simple as that, sometimes it's not, you know, scientific. It was first recorded on March 5th, 1997, and it sounds, honestly, it sounds like my PS4. It sounds really loud, it sounds like a really loud, really hot fan that's gonna just, just lift up and take off in the middle of playing Warzone. I'm like, hi, no, come back. Here's the clip. The leading theory as to what's making the sound is not a surprising one. Large icebergs grounding near Ross Sea and Cape Adair. Again, that's probably the most plausible explanation here. Friendly reminder that more than 80% of the ocean is undiscovered, so my only question is, what if it's not? Number one, 52 hertz whale. I love whales because they're the closest thing to a dinosaur, in my opinion. They're massive, we have no idea how they mate, that's still a mystery, we mentioned that in another list. They're beautiful, complex creatures that we should just leave alone. Probably, definitely. Especially the 52 Hertz whale. Well, maybe not too alone because there's a documentary about this sound. Joshua Zeman made a documentary about the loneliest whale on the planet. Sounds pretty depressing, but it's equally as interesting. For decades now, we've heard this sound. Back in 1989, the US Navy first detected this sound that measured in at more than twice the frequency of a normal, healthy whale call. So this thing's loud. Originally, what got them intrigued was the fact that this could have been a military mechanical sound, of course. But then they thought, well, maybe it's an animal. Perhaps this is like a new Cthulhu hybrid dinosaur thing that someone's working on. This is a lonely whale, but why is its frequency scaring away possible friends and mates? Starting us off at number 10, we have sweet wrappers. Some of you might be confused and not know what that is. And if you are one of those people, they are more commonly known as candy wrappers, or trash, or even rubbish, or even garbage. I think you get it now. Anyway, along with that other plastic bag that we talked about in the first video, candy wrappers and tons of other human garbage were found in the depths of the Marianas Trench. The deepest spot on earth is still not untouched by humans. This is a sad discovery that scientists were not thrilled about, but it was also a huge wake up call too. So let's continue to be careful with our trash and where we put it. The plastic bag was one thing, but when I found out that that was just the beginning of the human trash that they found down there, that was a little upsetting. So stop eating sweets and candy. I'm, I'm just kidding, I, I know we pretty much can't do that, but just be careful where we put our garbage. Number nine, siphonophore. We know that there are some pretty gnarly creatures that live in the big blue, and adding to that list, we have the siphonophore. Check out this guy. Oh, how cool. What? I mean, oh my gosh. 
This creature was discovered 2,000 feet below the Indian Ocean by a robot exploring a canyon. At first glance, it kind of looks like a piece of trash, maybe like a toilet brush attached to like a plastic bag or several. It has many working parts, all with a different job. It can even glow if it wants to. Some parts of its body can catch prey, digest food, reproduce, and others, of course, swim. Busy dudes. They can grow up to lengths of 40 meters, which is longer than a blue whale, which, by the way, is Earth's biggest animal. However, in terms of width, it's only about as wide as a broomstick. What's even crazier is that in 2020, the year when the world shut down, scientists still discovered the longest version, 150 meters, making it the longest creature ever discovered. Number eight, Mahabalipuram. The early life of Mahabalipuram is shrouded in mystery. Though it was once part of the Pallava dynasty that ruled over part of southern India between the third and ninth centuries AD. But prior to this, legends allude to the first king Bali, Mahabali, has sacrificed himself to the fifth avatar of Vishnu, after which he became enlightened. Based on discoveries made by excavators, this spot was really active in the trade of goods and other artifacts, even having trade with the Romans. It was a hub of culture, art, and literature full of thriving life. One of the biggest attractions was a complex series of temples called the Seven Pagodas of Mahabalipuram. However, today, only one of the seven can still be seen as the others are submerged underwater. Other legends say that the god Indra became jealous of the architectural elegance and caused flooding in order to submerge the city, which may very well be the reason it's beneath the waves today, due to the wrath of the gods. Number seven, a mysterious chest. Where'd my scarf go? It's in the chest. It's in the ocean. Beneath the waves and the swells of the Indian Ocean, there is a mysterious chest that could contain treasure for all humanity, or evil. Who knows? Underwater snaps of the chest show that it belongs to a cargo ship from the 1800s. The trunk was discovered during a search for the missing MH370 flight that went missing, but they found two shipwrecks instead, so they're like, wow, shipwrecks, not people. At first, they got really excited when they came across the debris field, thinking that they had finally found the missing craft. But then they found out they were pirate ships and they're like, wow, exciting. Even more mysterious though is that the WA Maritime Museum has no records of the ships, thinking that it may have been a ship lost at sea and everybody died on board. However, whatever is in the chest remains to be seen and the search for the missing plane continues. Number six, the oldest tsunami victims. Over a thousand years ago on the east coast of Africa, there was a Swahili fishing village bustling and busy along their day. But then all of a sudden, a tsunami devastated the village. Based on findings published in National Geographic revealed a macabre discovery. They found a site in Tanzania that is the first and oldest tsunami deposit bearing human remains found in East Africa. The oldest human remains in a tsunami deposit was also found in the Indian Ocean just across the way in Papua New Guinea and is 7,000 years old. However, this tsunami doesn't appear to have been that big. But I mean, a tsunami is a tsunami, you know? It's a big deal, either way. But because the people live so close to the ocean and they were on the other side of it, they would have had no warning. No earthquake to hear that it was coming. So, poor guys. Number five, the lost city of Krishna. For all the Atlantis fans out there, sadly it wasn't that. But just because it wasn't doesn't mean it wasn't, I don't know, cool. In my opinion, it's cooler because it's real. For a long time, people in India considered Laura Krishna's city of Dwarka a myth, until all of a sudden, it wasn't. Indian scientists finally discovered the lost city had been submerged off the northwestern coast of India. It is now one of the best studied underwater sites and has become a famous attraction. It is even considered one of the four dharmas, a sacred place of pilgrimage and worship. Lord Krishna founded the holy city and numerous stone structures still remain. Research suggests that it used to be the busiest port town before it sunk beneath the waves over four to 5,000 years ago. Number four, the Gondwana pieces. A mysterious ancient continent called Gondwana was discovered in the Indian Ocean and scientists were stoked. It was an ancient supercontinent formed over 500 million years ago. It broke up about 180 million years ago into the land masses that make up Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, the Indian subcontinent, and the Arabian Peninsula. Researchers are only discovering that there were microcontinents beneath basalt rocks when they found fossils. They were like, whoa, wait, animals used to live here? What is this thing? This discovery could mean that previously established beliefs about how the plate tectonics broke apart could could be shattered, just like the continent was over hundreds of millions of years ago. Number three, a transformer. I feel like the ocean is a perfect spot for aliens to vacation, you know? Like, why not? Tons of scenery, plenty of food, opportunity to pull pranks on humans. Why the heck not? It's perfect. So when this was discovered, everyone was shocked, except for me, because I don't know if I can be surprised on this channel anymore. When a new species turns up, the first thing the world says, it's aliens! 
friends, but this very well may be a new creature in the crazy world that lives beneath the waves. However, you have to admit the footage is pretty bizarre. It looks like a creature is literally transforming itself 3,700 feet below. Check out this clip. At 40 flights, it becomes more active and starts swimming around the craft almost as if it's teasing them. I don't know, friends. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. New octopus or alien friends? Both. Number two, Diego Garcia. Now, I know this wasn't technically recovered, but it sure is terrifying. The island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean has a murky and mystery past that the CIA doesn't like to talk about. It may have been their secret prison where they tormented their captives. The US government has persistently denied claims that it operated a secret war on terror within the confines of the island. But that wouldn't be the first time or last time they lied about something. A Swiss senator by the name of Dick Martin. Marty was the one who produced a detailed report alleging the torment that happened on the island. Marty told the European Parliament, We have received concurring confirmations that United States agencies have used Diego Garcia, which is the international legal responsibility of the UK, in the processing of high value detainees. Processing was in quotations, so you can only imagine what that was hinting at. Number one, a mysterious glow. The Milky Sea has been a phenomenon for ages, but as of yet, no one has quite been able to explain it. Jules Verne even wrote about the Milky Sea in his famous novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The legend of the Milky Sea became just that when sailors would come in from sailing. They'd be like, whoa, did you check out this weird sea that we came across? It was crazy. But they'd be like, dude, you're nuts. Even in modern times, scientists dismissed it because the level of bacteria needed to create that would be colossal and they considered that impossible. Yet it exists. Essentially, it's a glowing part of the Indian Ocean with an unknown source which remains under debate. The leading theory is that it has to do with large collective of bioluminescent fish plankton hanging about. The reason it was proven was that Steve Miller checked a British merchant vessel that reported seeing it in January 25th, 1995. And I quote, On a clear moonless night while 150 nautical miles east of the Somalian coast, a whitish glow was observed on the horizon and, after 15 minutes of steaming, the ship was completely surrounded by a sea of milky white color. It appeared as though the ship was sailing over a field of snow or gliding over the clouds. Miller used the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, DMSP, and its polar orbiting satellites to detect this ethereal event. He matched the coordinates recorded by the ship to the date, and then he found it when he actually just waited and watched for it. The glowing spot spanned 15,400 kilometers of glowing Indian Ocean for three nights in January. Number 10, One Dumb Diver. This this first story is from Reddit user One Dumb Diver, and boy does he live up to his name. His first mistake was heading out for a 90 foot dive alone, but he was just 15 years old and thought how bad could it be. He needed to clear his head so he headed out on his family's boat to the reef. While floating down at 90 feet, second mistake, he was only rated for 60, he saw a 3.5 meter mako shark. Mako sharks according to the diver only have two speeds, curious and lunch mode. Guess which mode this guy was in. Divers now use electronic pulses to freak out sharks, but he was using the older method of a chainmail sleeve. They bite the metal, they think, ugh, gross, swim away. But mistake number three, he forgot the sleeve on his bed at home. Shark bit down, there was now an open gashing wound in the water and salt was burning his flesh. Mistake number four, he had drifted a quarter mile downstream from his boat. Luckily, he made it to shore and 172 stitches, physical therapy to repair his tricep, and some crazy scars later, this deep sea diver never made the same mistakes ever again. Number 9. Venomous Sea Snakes Last year in the deep waters off Australia's coast, of course it's Australia, always Australia, a sea snake that was once thought to be extinct has been rediscovered. How fun. He's like, ah, psych, you thought. Just when you thought the ocean couldn't get even more dangerous, now we got new sea snakes to worry about. The short-nosed sea snake hasn't been seen in 23 years, and they would often live near Ashmore Reef. But last year, divers found one 67 meters below the surface in the twilight zone, which is pretty wild. Just lurking in the dark, just hanging out, meditating. The Australian Institute of Marine Science is responsible for this discovery, and the team calls this a second chance to protect and further understand the species. And an up-close personal encounter is brought to life from this diver. Apparently, this happens from time to time before major storms. Snakes can sense an oncoming storm, so what they try and do is latch onto something heading in the direction towards shore. So they don't have to burn energy and they can just grab onto like a barrel or something and then just, you know, make its way there. Pretty smart. So this diver was exploring, nothing was going crazy or anything like that, and then he felt a snake wrap onto his leg because he felt a storm was coming in. The diver didn't even know that a storm was coming. The snake did, and he wrapped its 
snake self around his leg. As soon as I was in the shallows, it uncurled and headed up the beach where it hid under a breadfruit tree. That was from a diver named Specialist Celery. Great name, also terrifying experience. I don't like snakes in water or on land. Next, number eight, surprise tiger shark. Yeah, not something you wanna see diving in the deep, a tiger shark. A glowing shark, left shark, I don't care. I want none of the shark smoke. This deep sea discovery comes from user Stormcutter, sick name, a little bit better of a diver name. They say, I know a guy who was out diving for crayfish and lobster by the ocean. Also, the I know a guy trick, it was totally you. Don't lie to us. Crayfish often hide under the rocks, so as he was diving, a tiger shark emerged from a cave and rammed him, breaking his arm and ribs. This guy got shucked by a shark, that's insane. He said the shark was testing him out. Yeah, I'd say. That's pretty sweet, man. I'm glad you survived, honestly. I bet you couldn't wait to tell people what happened. You're like, oh, my ribs? Yeah, I got sideswiped by a tiger shark. Yeah, he's feeling testy, you know how tiger sharks do. If you're wondering what that experience may have looked like, uh, this is footage of a rare tiger shark in New Zealand lurking in the deep. Number seven, Humpback Mama. This deep dive happened about a year ago. A diver named Sidetrack38, that's their username, not their legal name, although that would be pretty sweet. Sidetrack38, he's like, what's up? They were exploring the ocean one afternoon when all of a sudden they got charged by a mother humpback whale. The diver shared their experience online, saying, her curious calf had swam around us and we were between her and the calf. Two of us never even saw her coming. We were watching the baby, but our third diver, saw her come. She kicked down and swam under us last minute. We didn't see anything until that 60 foot freight train passed just underneath us. Whales are beautiful. They're beautiful but terrifying creatures, my friend. Glad you didn't get a broken rib or back in this case because whales, they like to go pretty deep. Just a view. Just trying to figure us Incredible. out. Incredible. Oh, yeah, this is amazing. Justin, you want the whole <laughs> off? Look at that view. I hope we're getting screen captures of this. Number six, Mako Shark. Mako sharks are one of the fastest sharks in the world. I'll start by saying that. Just get that fact in your head. Given this list so far, I would also start sweating if I were you. This is a scary one. This deep dive horror story comes from username One Dumb Diver. Great name. They clearly made this account just to share this occasion. So let's dive in. Nowadays, we dive with shark shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away. But back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve. The idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and then move along. So I wait, it comes over, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, the crunch, it occurred to me that I had left my sleeve on my bed. Now I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water, and I trailed blood everywhere. Not an ideal scenario. So once the shock finally wore off, you realize that you're in salt water, and salt and open wounds, they don't feel good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Not great. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which meant that I had to swim back up to it. After getting bitten by a shark, imagine having to swim, that is a nightmare scenario. Glad you're okay. Also, you're not a dumb diver. You're just, you're experiencing the things. You're figuring it out. You're doing great. You're brave. I don't even like going in lakes. Number five. More sea snakes. Coming from Patrick667, about a year ago as well, they posted, so three days ago, I went snorkeling off Mimba Island in Zanzibar. Everything went normal and we started heading back, so I grabbed my net and I put my black fins, my black mask, snorkel, and black wetsuit inside. Once back ashore, I grab my bag, jump off the boat, and head to the rental office to return said equipment. At that point, I feel my bag is moving somehow. At first look, it seemed like a flat black worm squirming quickly. After rotating the bag, I realized I was looking at only the tail of a one meter long black sea snake, one of the most venomous reptiles ever, trying to get out of the net, like in the lobby. How it got there, I have no freaking clue. That is a nightmare scenario. Imagine being like, thanks so much, I had a great time. Here's a sand dollar. <laughs> also, don't mind the venomous snake. Number four, the frilled shark. Back in 2004, marine biologists discovered this dinosaur, the frilled shark, just hanging out, just lurking about 870 meters below the surface. So if you're anywhere around there, watch out. This one looks like an eel almost. It's so scary looking, it's so slippery and quick. 
Frilled sharks can grow up to seven feet long and they fight in the dark. They don't need to see to attack you, which is pretty terrifying considering all these deep dive stories are all in the pitch black. So unless you're a deep diver, you're not really gonna run into the frilled shark. Have you ever dealt with one of these? Are you a diver? Are you watching this because you're a diver? Please comment down below if you are. Comment some of your personal experiences. These were a nightmare to read. I couldn't even finish half of them. Everything is so dangerous and so fast underwater. Number three, snapping shrimp. This little guy can literally create a sonic boom as it attacks you, that's how fast it is. You won't see him coming, and neither did this diver. Here's a clip of a mantis shrimp punching through a diver's gear. Yeah, right through their water shoes. Bam! Ah. Ow, that really hurt. They're so quick, oh my God, they're tiny, but they, they really hit. They're often found in coral reefs, oyster reefs. These little guys, these pistol shrimp, they hit their prey at 100 kilometers per hour. And in doing so, a large air bubble is created and because this you know, Mike Tyson shrimp is so quick with the left hook, the following pop is around 200 decibels. The sound alone can stun its prey and if they're lucky, it sometimes kills them. That's how you wanna go out. You don't wanna go out with one of these Superman punches to the neck. Number two, comb stars. Ocean life is by far the scariest thing out there. We have no idea what's in our oceans. We discover some crazy shit every year. Some deep sea fish with bioluminescence are for sure aliens, while others are just natural predators. That looks scary. Like the comb star, for example. This guy was not in Finding Nemo. He would have been a weird addition. A comb star is a starfish that contains tetrodoxin, which is this deadly neurotoxin that can cause paralysis. Yeah, Finding Nemo, that movie would be over in eight minutes if this guy was there. Per every gram of comb star flesh, there's enough toxin to take out 500 mice. So if you have a mice problem, Honestly, you can call one guy. It's a very specific weird call, but I know how you can do it. A little bit of tetrodoxin. Tetrodoxin? Tecrodoxin. That's what it's called. And finally, coming in at number one, the electric eel. Awesome. That's the worst thing I've ever seen. Great. The moray eel, first of all, don't do what he just did. Don't go up to a random eel and start rubbing it like it's a genie lamp. That's not smart. It's not a great dane. You don't want to do that. That was the moray eel. That one can bite your fingers off in like two seconds. But you should never touch an eel in the first place because a lot of them are electric. Yeah, just like that MGMT song that's now stuck in our heads. As its name suggests, there's types of eels that can mess you up even if you were to get the first hit. Specifically, the newly discovered two and a half meter Electrophorus volti. Appropriately named after Alessandro Volta, AKA the guy who invented the battery, this eel can release a shock up to 860 volts, which is more than seven times the voltage of a wall plug. A swimming wall plug that gets hungry. Nice, we love nature. I'm never swimming again. Kicking off the list at number 10, glow in the dark shark. Yeah, you thought left shark was the coolest fish in the pond? Think again, pal. Glow in the dark sharks, apparently we got them. Terrifying. Two years ago, scientists were able to identify three deep sea sharks. The kite fin, the black belly lantern, and the southern lantern shark. All three of them look like they're from Pandora. They're glowing. They're literally glowing. Bioluminescence is fascinating. We mentioned the deep sea angler fish in part one of this list. So now we've got glowy gill Gary over here to worry about. Awesome, I'm never swimming again. These sharks were found in the twilight zone, around 1,000 meters deep off the coast of New Zealand. Yep, never swimming again, ever again. Let's move on. Number nine, funny from the outside. Okay, this one is scary and funny at the same time, and yes, it also involves sharks. Sometimes fear of the thing itself makes you do some pretty weird things to avoid it, which eventually makes the worst thing happen. Reddit user NZVikingRugger has to wear eye contacts, which makes wearing a mask even more of a necessity. The idea of going without them surpassed any other fears, even as a shark headed straight for her. While on a dive, a friend behind her had collided with a shark and her mask was knocked off. She couldn't stop thinking about the fact that her mask was knocked off, that even as a shark headed straight for her, she was, she was more afraid of that. Usually sharks are more curious than anything and usually they just shoulder bump you as they turn at the last minute, but this one wasn't. She was beelining for Viking. She kept calm though and at the last second the shark was about to knock her mask, the diver just headbutted the shark in the nose. She may be the only person to ever headbutt 11 foot shark because she was afraid she might lose her mask. And she's alive, so good for her. Number eight, food poisoning. I, I can't think of a worse time to get food poisoning than like while scuba diving. Actually, I probably can. There, there's probably something worse, like I don't know, in front of like your crush or something like that. But um, this one is definitely up there. Reddit user someguy12 recounts the moment 
he had to deal with seeing yesterday's lunch on a deep sea dive. He was 14, a relatively new diver, and just hit 20 meters below the surface with his dad and brother. About 45 minutes out, a foreboding churning began in his stomach. And, well, he started to upchuck into the water. The worst part is that the fish surrounding him thought it was lunchtime. <laughs> And they were like, whoa, look, sandwiches. No one was within arm's reach, so he had to keep clearing his regulator, puke, and then repeat until he was like, all clear. No one noticed, and he just kept on with the rest of the dive. <laughs> I am as horrified as I am impressed with his perseverance, but like, dude, go up to the service. That's enough. Number seven, shark rescue. Being a rescue diver means you often have to put yourself at risk in order to recover people who got themselves into trouble. Keith Baugh is a rescue diver in the Bahamas and he was on a mission to find a missing diver. He was submerged in the infamous blue hole in the Bahamas and finally caught a flash of the diver's watch on his arm. He started swimming to the bottom and began to notice that the bottom was moving. An entire school of sharks were swimming right over the body. It was breeding season and there were so many sharks he couldn't see the bottom. He found the diver though and as quick as he could began swimming up to the surface. Thing with diving though is if you rise too quickly you could get something called the bends, aka decompression sickness. The shark started following him and when he reached 70 feet he had to take a break to adjust and therefore spent 8 minutes surrounded by a school of sharks with a dead body in one hand. Ugh, like how he got out of there without turning into shark food is pretty astounding. Number six, shipwrecked. Tom Pritchard had over 1,000 dives under his belt, was known for being incredibly detail oriented and cautious. Nothing should have gone wrong, but of course, something did. Just what remains a mystery. Pritchard was working on attaching a mooring line to the Andrea Doria. The Andrea Doria is a shipwreck 300 miles outside of New York. When the line was attached, the other crew members explored the wreck before rising 75 minutes later. But where was Pritchard? The Coast Guard swept the area, but no one was found, and in the end, the captain ordered the crew not to return to look for him. After all, they had no idea how he disappeared, so going back down there could be even more dangerous. They could lose more people. The Doria has always been considered dangerous and has claimed 15 lives previously. As the years go on, the wreckage continues to get less and less stable. But whether Pritchard was trapped by the ship or died due to equipment failure, no one will ever know, and it just is. No one will ever know. Number five, Snake Island. The problem with deep diving is that if there is a problem, you can't just rush up to the surface or you might literally explode internally decompression sickness. So staying calm is paramount, but it's not always enough. Three divers decided to take on a 180 meter dive in Snake Wall in the Georgia Strait. One of the men stayed in the shallower area while the other two decided to dive as deep as they could. While they were down there, something happened, something went wrong, and while the second diver almost made it to the surface, he too perished as well. They were experienced divers, they wouldn't have been able to go in there if they weren't. So just exactly what happened to the two at the bottom still remains a mystery because it could have been as simple as an equipment failure, but there's no proof. Number four, they checked no. There is a reason why high risk activities require you to sign and fill in a waiver or consent form. They ask about your health because you or someone else could be put at risk because of it. This one diver decided to check no on the form when it asked if they had epilepsy. Flash forward to a seizure attack in a pitch black cavern 85 feet below the water. In this story submitted by Reddit user Sharkbite, they noticed one of the diver's lights weren't moving. After heading over to see what was wrong, they noticed that the diver had no regulator in their mouth, which is the breathing apparatus, and their eyes were completely checked out and their teeth were clenched together. They forcibly purged the air into their mouth with the regulator, which moved their cheeks enough to indicate air was going in. That was good enough for them. The rescue diver then grabbed their arm and swam up straight 60 feet to get them to surface, risking the bends. Once to the shore, the rest of the team helped get their gear off, and though in shock, the diver recovered like nothing happened. Thankfully, they were only 10 minutes into the dive, otherwise they would have both ended up sick. The rescue diver was put at risk, shooting up to the surface to save them both and said they would do it again if need be. And I mean, I would too, but like, boy, would I be pissed. Hopefully, 
This person didn't discover that they have epilepsy below the water. That could be a thing too. But if they knew and didn't say, Ooh, someone's gonna get a stern talking to, wow. Number three, sanctum. Even the most experienced divers can encounter deadly complications on dives. And to this day, no one knows what brought Agnes Maloka down. Agnes was a stunt diver who had a fierce desire for underwater exploration. By age 29, she'd been featured in multiple documentaries and even acted in the movie Sanctum. But while on a dive in the tank caves in Australia, even her expert navigational skills were no match for the sinkholes, caves, and silt. Somehow she became separated from her diving buddy and silt from the cave walls disrupted her vision. If you breathe too hard, the air bubbles would pop and disturb the ceiling and it would come crashing down. The following day, they found her body 500 meters from the entrance of the cave. Evans suggests that she remained calm until her last breath, but no one knows what the exact reason was for her struggle. It could have been she ran out of air, anything could have happened, but either way, she lost her life. Number two, Plura Caves. Norway's Plura Caves used to be a spot where experienced divers would test their metal but ever since this incident, they have been closed indefinitely. In February 2014, several divers prepared to make the long trek to the other side of the cave, but 135 meters down, they lost two of their members. One member, Jari, got stuck halfway in a narrow passage, which caused immediate panic. That far down, that's a very dangerous thing. Fellow diver Patrick handed him an extra cylinder to prevent hypercapnia, which is excessive CO2 in the bloodstream, so like hyperventilating, but Jari panicked while switching and he drowned right in front of Patrick's eyes. Can't imagine that. Patrick did everything he could to stay calm and had to keep moving. But behind them, divers Kai and another man named Jari were due for a shock. Jari saw the body of Jari and panicked even though Kai tried to help him and sadly, Jari succumbed to the same fate. With the passage now fully blocked, Kai had to trek 11 hours back the same way he came all the way to the start. Two months later, Patrick and Kai went back secretly to recover their friends in which they succeeded, but no one else is allowed in those caves ever since then. Number one, Dion Dreyer. And last but not least, the tale of Dion Dreyer. If this story doesn't haunt you, I don't know what will. Dion passed away in 1994 when his body was lost 270 meters in Bushman's Hole, South Africa. For 10 years, his body remained there, but extreme diver David Shaw decided it was time to bring him home. But the dive went nowhere near as expected. With Shaw's experience in situations like this, there wasn't a doubt in anyone's mind he'd be okay. Shaw assembled a team and made the descent 270 70 meters down to find Dryer. But when Shaw tried to put the body in a body bag, the skeleton started floating due to the wetsuit Dryer still wore. At those depths, any panic or disorientation could be deadly, and indeed it was for Shaw. As he wrestled with the body and began his ascent, his light got snagged and he panicked because he already overexerted himself. Dave eventually passed out, and before long, Bushman's Hole claimed his life as well. But almost poetically, the two bodies floated up to the surface together. Shaw made sure he fulfilled his mission even with his last breath. Kicking off the list at number 10. Titan's Ocean. Yeah, we'll start this list with an ocean signal out of this world. I mean that in a literal sense. This first one comes from Thanos' home planet, Titan. Yeah, it's one of Saturn's many moons. Saturn has 82 moons in total, so if you were a werewolf and you lived on Saturn, odds are you'd be pretty exhausted. Around 10 years ago, NASA's Cassini spacecraft detected water inside the shell of ice that is that moon. That's pretty exciting. Also, water in space anywhere is exciting, but also I'm like, mm, aliens, they're coming. To quote a Cassini team member, the search for water is an important goal in solar system exploration, and now we've spotted another place where it's abundant. Abundant, did you hear that? It's abundant, nice. We love abundant sea creatures resting on the moon Titan. NASA has detected low frequency radio waves on Saturn's icy moon, and it sounds pretty eerie. To know this is off planet entirely, if there's water involved, I don't wanna hear any space whales. I'm all set. In our number nine spot today, we have sea pigs. These guys are a genus of sea cucumber, but they have these little tube-like legs, which is why they look super weird. Not that regular sea cucumbers look exceptionally normal, but these ones look even weirder than the regular ones. They like to live on the seafloor where they move through the sediment searching for their next meal. They eat by extracting tiny little particles of organic matter that have fallen from closer to the surface of the ocean down to the mud on the seafloor. They're like the best little Roombas. Sea pigs tend to measure somewhere around 15 centimeters or 4 to 6 inches long and they live at a depth of somewhere between 1,200 to 5,000 meters deep in the sea. These guys have their own special little defense mechanism and that is how their skin carries a natural poison which would 
would make them a less than ideal meal for their predators. It is quite imperative that these guys stay in their deep sea habitat because they are specifically built for that and when brought up closer to the surface, they disintegrate. Coming in at our number 8 spot, we have robots. Say what? Are the AIs finally taking over? Are aliens actually just ancient robots like the Autobots and Decepticons? What is going on down there? Well, none of those that we know of. But the reason why we have been able to search and discover new areas of our oceans at such great depths is because scientists and researchers have started using robots, or more commonly known as rovers down at the bottom of the ocean. Just like the rovers we use on the moon and Mars, these underwater rovers can go where humans cannot, as well as retrieve materials that we would never be able to retrieve by our Ourselves. So as nervous as I am about the robots taking over, I have to tip my hat to them in this regard. So thanks robo dudes. In our number 7 spot today we have the Hydro Medusa. This fancy pants jellyfish came as quite a surprise during a robotic exploration of the Mariana Trench in 2016. What at first looked like some sort of alien spacecraft turned out to be a new unidentified species of jellyfish. At a first sight this jelly had its tentacles splayed out as if it was ready to catch some prey. Apparently the tentacles act as a sort of netting to ensnare and then subdue their potential prey, but this jelly quickly calmed down and continued floating on by. This guy was found near the Enigma Seamount at a depth of 3,700 meters. The really interesting thing about this jelly is in its bell. While the bell itself is translucent, inside are glowing red and yellow bulbs of light. The glowing bulbs of light really do give it an otherworldly appearance and it is simply amazing to look at. At number 6 we have a retired US Navy officer. Yeah you heard me, Victor Vescovo is a retired US Navy officer and is one of the 70 people on earth who have earned the explorers grand slam title. After Vescovo retired from the navy, he became a private equity investor with a humongous interest in exploring the wildest places on earth. He has completed the 7 summits exploring the highest points on earth from each continent and most recently completed the 5 deeps expedition where he visited the 5 deepest points on earth, one of them being, of course, the Marianas Trench. In 2019, in the expedition known as the Challenger Deep. Vescovo and his team visited the deepest point on Earth during that expedition at 11 kilometers below the ocean's surface and earned Guinness World Records for their explorations. Vescovo helped fund to hire the amazing team he had on board as well as to build the latest high tech submarine to reach such depths. They were at an area of ocean that is 1000 times the pressure of the surface. Big ouch. So if you want to get deep, I suggest you take Victor Vescovo with you. Coming in at number 5 at our halfway mark we have comb jellies. Comb jellies are one of the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen in my life and that is mostly due to their combs. The combs I'm talking about are actually plates of fused cilia which help these jellies propel themselves through the deep waters of the Mariana Trench like their own little boat oars. There are other creatures who also have combs but these jellies are the largest creatures with them. Why these jellies are so beautiful is because the combs create a sort of rainbow effect because of the light being scattered in different directions because the cilia are moving. Comb jellies only have one pair of tentacles but Sometimes it appears to be more, but that is because their tentacles can branch out. These jellies don't sting and instead their tentacles are used as a sort of fishing line to help them catch their prey. Coming in at number 4 is James Cameron. Wait, hold on a sec, Olivia, did I just say Academy Award winning director James Cameron was found at the bottom of the Marianas Trench? You did! I did! Yes, I did. I'm so dumb. <laughs> oh my god, hashtag fire Dewey. <laughs> Along with making one of his most famous movies ever about an old boat, it was also his lifelong dream of exploring the depths of the Marianas Trench. This guy just can't get enough of the underwater life, and honestly, I can't blame him because it looks super cool. Anyway, back in 2012, Cameron with the team of scientists visited the trench at a depth of 11 kilometers as well. Wait, isn't that the exact same depth as Victor Vescovo? Yeah, kinda. Vescovo was able to reach just a bit further than Cameron, so this time the Oscar goes to Victor. Sorry, Jimbo. But Cameron also helped design a 24 underwater submersible sub called the Deep Sea Challenger in the shape of Titanic. <laughs> just kidding, that would be insensitive. The windows on the sub were 9.5 inches thick, so they could withstand the immense pressure. While down there, they discovered 68 new species, mostly of bacteria, but also also a couple invertebrates as well. So there you go, James Cameron is just not a one trick pony. In our number 3 spot today we have the barrel eye. I can talk about creatures that look otherworldly all day and while the Mariana Trench is full of them, the barrel eye is definitely nearing the top of that list. These guys are also known as spookfish and they have these large protruding telescopic eyes that are enclosed in a transparent dome of soft tissue. That was a long way of saying they have a see through head and it is so weird to look at. These guys can't be taken out of their deep sea environment because they are unable to withstand the change in pressure, so for a while after their initial discovery 
story, the only way people who had seen them in the deep sea could show anyone else what they looked like was through drawings. Imagine trying to tell someone that you found a fish with a see through head, but you have no evidence to prove it. These guys are usually found motionless, just kind of floating in one spot as they don't tend to move around a bunch at a depth of around 600 to 800 meters in the ocean. Coming in at our number 2 spot is the unknown. There is still plenty of unknown left in the Marianas Trench. Countless people have now explored down there, but the water is just above freezing and it is extremely dark and the pressure is an immense 8 tons per square inch. Holy burst eardrums Batman! With all the tech that we have today, we are still doing all that we can to find new ways of exploring the ocean depths for longer and with more visibility. It's hard to say just how much we have really uncovered when we can only go down there for so long and with just our little rovers, subs, flashlights, and Hollywood directors. Either way, I I can't wait to see where scientists take us on this next one and who knows, maybe one day I will get my confirmed sea monster that I have been waiting for my entire freaking life. In our number one spot today, we have the predatory tuna kit. The predatory tuna kit is like the Venus flytrap of the deep sea. These guys are one of the most unique creatures I've ever learned about personally because I don't know any other animal that is like them. They start out life kind of like tadpoles and then they swim until they find their perfect spot either along a canyon wall or on the sea floor. Once they've found their spot, they plant themselves in place using a natural adhesive that they produce. Once planted, they will undergo a huge change and this is where they will stay for the rest of their lives. They're super picky about where exactly they make their homes because it will be where they stay and because they need to make sure that both the chemicals in the water in that area as well as the temperature of the water is just right. Like the three little bears of the deep sea. Unfortunately, if these guys get moved from the location they choose to make their home, they will die, so it is imperative that they are left alone. They basically wait for food to drift on by and, like a Venus flytrap, when they get their meal, their mouths will snap shut until they're done digesting. The predatory tunicate is a point of study in the medical world because they actually have been known to help with some more serious medical conditions, which is always an incredible thing. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the train. The train is a sound that was first recorded on March 5th, 1997. It is often referred to as the train because, well, it kind of sounds like a train's whistle or maybe like the sound of the wheels grinding against the tracks. But in my opinion, it just sounds like a ghost meetup. Despite the years it's been since this sound was captured, no one is entirely sure where it came from. The current belief is that it may have been from an extremely large iceberg in the Ross Sea near Cape Adair, but that is still only a guess. The steady hum might be the sound of the keel of an iceberg dragging across the sea floor. But what if it's not? At number 9 we have the Siberian Lake Monster. Of course if we're doing a list of scary things that live underwater, we have to throw a giant mysterious sea monster monster on here. What separates the Siberian lake monster from other more popular guys that we have seen like Loch Ness and that kind of stuff is that underwater scans have actually picked this guy up. This thing is deep in Lake Labinkure and some radar has shown that it looks like a 33 foot long creature is living there. Now this is probably just a skeleton, but if this thing is dead, it means that there was once a giant man eating monster in this lake. I thought we were supposed to be safe in fresh water. They've nicknamed this thing the devil, so you know he's a good time. And loves company. So next time you go up to the cottage and you're swimming in the water and you feel safe, remember there might be a giant monster lurking underneath the water ready to turn you into a side dish. At number 8 we have the blue hole. Now there are several blue holes in the world. There's one in Belize, there's one in the Red Sea, there's a giant one in my heart that was left there from when Reboot ended on a cliffhanger. How are you going to end a show that so many people fell in love with on a cliffhanger? I will never trust again. Well this one is between Cape Verde and the Caribbean Island. Scientists are really confused about this thing. It's a crack in the bottom of the ocean floor and is several thousand miles long. What's strange about this is there's no explanation of how this happened. It might have been tectonic plates moving around, but when this happened the earth will probably start to repair itself and there's been no sign of this. My theory is this is where Godzilla goes to sleep at night. I mean it seems like the most logical answer. It's either that or the gateway to hell. Like come on guys, I'm doing real science work here. At number 7 we have the Yanaguni complex. This was discovered by scuba divers in the 1980s. I think that's the scariest part about this one. Could you imagine going scuba diving back in the 80s? The technology back then must have been a tube going up to some guy who would blast fresh air down to you using a bicycle pump. I don't even think they had decompression sickness figured out back then. The chances of you coming up the bends was probably 
super high. Well, if it wasn't for a few divers in Japan who were willing to sacrifice it all to look at some cool stuff, we wouldn't know anything about the Yanaguni complex. It's still a mystery as to what this thing is. It looks like some temples that might have existed thousands of years ago, but when the ice age decided to melt, it would have covered this entire area. This could be why an entire civilization got plunged underwater. Or the temple could have been on a cliff, and then when a massive earthquake hit, it knocked the temple into the water. But like everything in life, there are some haters who say this whole thing is just a natural rock formation. Some people just want to ruin everything. At number 6 we have Anacora Sista Twista. One of the reasons why the underwater world is such a mystery is because we find things like this in there. Sure there are beautiful things down there like bright fish and chubby marine mammals, but there's also the unknown unidentified organisms like Anacora Sista Twista, which should be the name of an 80s hair metal band. But what is this thing? Well it's a protist. And what is a protist you may ask? Well it's an organism that doesn't belong to any animal group, fungus or plant group. What does that mean? I really have no idea you guys. I think it means it could be an alien. Some alien came down to earth for a swim and then scraped its knee on some coral and now we have alien creatures running around the ocean. Probably waiting for you to pee so it can swim up your pee hole and then work its way into your brain. It's really the only logical answer. At number 5 we have the Bimini Road. How were the pyramids made? Was it aliens coming down to share their technology and secrets with us or was it just thousands upon thousands of slaves who sacrificed their lives and their spines to build them? Well we don't know and we may never know but the Bimini road is another one of these mysteries. It's off the coast of the Bahamas and it looks like it could have been a pathway that was placed perfectly with giant slabs of rock. Similar to the way the pyramids were made, it seems that these large slabs of rock were too large to be moved by man and also like the pyramids, these giant slabs were also perfectly placed so well. So where does everyone's mind go when something like this happens? Well, magic or aliens. The logical answer is that this is a natural phenomenon of the water moving and hitting the rocks to make these formations, but people think that this was made using advanced technology from aliens and could have been the road to Atlantis. Honestly, I like the Atlantis theory much better. It's more fun. At number 4 we have Colossal Squid. Yeah this thing is a big no thanks for me. So everyone always talks about how there might be sea monsters out there, but this thing actually exists. There's never been one caught alive, but several have washed onto shores dead. And they are massive. The largest one ever discovered was 45 feet long and it was dead. So you know there was an even bigger one out there that killed this guy. They don't even have suckers on their tentacles, they have hooks. Let me say that again. This squid has 10 giant arms covered in hooks. This thing is straight out of a horror movie. Scientists aren't even sure what something this big eats. They think it probably feeds on whales or your deepest darkest fears. I wouldn't be surprised if the colossal squid works part time as a gatekeeper for hell. It makes me think that the old greek stories about the kraken might have been real. At number 3 we have underwater circles. Giant formations of circles that are formed underwater and nobody knows how they got there. These mysteries were discovered off the coast of North Carolina, Florida and Belize. Now what are they? Like many things on this list, myself and the entire scientific community have no idea. But here are some theories. Maybe they were formed naturally by either two things, water currents or some sort of animal mating ritual. Another idea is that these things were made by ancient civilizations before the ice age. All these things would have been above ground and might have been art left over by some old timey tribes. And the third theory is that they look kind of like a bullseye so it might be some sort of nuclear missile target and if you hit it hard enough the explosion will cause some sort of major natural disaster like an earthquake or tsunami or if we're lucky, both. At number 2 we have Megalodon. If you have a fear of sharks you're gonna love this one. Megalodon was a prehistoric shark that was even bigger than the giant hook tentacle beast that was earlier on this list. If you've already forgotten about the colossal squid, it clocked in at around 45 feet long, where Megalodon was closer to 60 feet long. It was a 60 foot shark that could probably rip a blue whale in half in one bite. Well maybe not that, but it was still a gargantuan creature with teeth the size of Brock Lesnar's fists. This thing wouldn't even chew you, it would just swallow you whole and then fart your skeleton out into the dark cold ocean. At number 1 on our list we have Giant Eyeball. A mysterious giant eyeball washed onto the shore of a Florida beach back in October of 2012. I don't know any other kind of giant eyeball other than a mysterious one. There's no super common regular giant eyeball just lying around. But this is also Florida. This is the state where people smoke crack at weddings and kiss alligators on the lips, so maybe it's a 
little more common over there. Well this giant eyeball was found by Gino Cavacci and he didn't know what the hell to make of it so he took it home and then stuck it in his freezer. Then he called the cops and the cops came in and told him we don't do giant eyeballs on the beach. You have to call the wildlife people. And then he called the wildlife people and they were like what the hell is that? And he was like I don't know I brought it to you guys to try and figure out what it is. And then some people were like maybe it's a sea monster and other people were like no it's probably from a marlin. And I think in the end no one really knew what the hell it was. But just so you know there's giant eyeballs out there just laying around the beach sometime. <laughs>